Christmas. So should we start? Okay. Should I close or? Yes. Okay. You can close too. Okay. okay. Okay, please take your seats and uh, let's continue. So let me now here uh, write down the, the Hamiltonian that we already derived for interacting Fermi gas with a contact interaction, short range interaction, just to have it in front all the time. Yeah, so, so the Hamiltonian is, is, a, is a, of course, a free particle term, sum of uh, momentum and sigma, and then we have epsilon p minus mu, and, and, and uh, oh, no, probably let's do it at the moment without mu, yeah, really Hamiltonian. That we have epsilon p, which is just p squared over 2m, and then we have a p sigma dagger, a p sigma, so it's just the number of, of, of fermions of a type sigma in a state with plane wave with momentum p. And then we have the interacting part plus H interaction. And for this, let me write down a couple of representation which we will use depending on the problem, one or another. Yeah? So, um, so H interaction, so one of the form, it's always G over v, g is the coupling constant. And then the one form was like this, where you have sum over p1, p2, and q. And then you have this a p1 plus q plus dagger, a p2 minus q minus dagger, and a p2 minus a p1 plus. This is one of the one of the form. Yeah, another form, which is equivalent one, uh, uh, this is uh, G integral over dr. Yeah? And there you have psi dagger plus r, psi dagger minus r, psi minus r, and psi plus r. This is another form, or this I can rewrite. You see, this is plus and minus. This is plus field, this is two minus. So I can pull and drag this one to here, or opposite this one to here, and then I have minus here, minus here, yeah? So in total, I can write it in the following way, G integral dr, such I want to write it in a form that is uh, familiar for you, maybe from other sides. When you have psi minus dagger r, psi minus r, and here you have psi dagger plus r, psi plus r. Yeah. And, and this, this, you recognize the density operator for the minus component at position r, and here you have the density operator of plus component at position r. So it's really density-density interaction, but of the opposite and minus and plus. Yeah, as we know, it's only different fermions can interact with the airway scattering. Yeah? So we will use different things of, of this, uh, depending on the problem. Yeah, so it's the all equivalent. And we know already what are the consequences of this. Of course, if you have interaction, your plane wave states, like with for pre particles, are not anymore in eigenstates. So they decay. And we uh, find out last time that it actually due to Pauli principle, what is called Pauli blocking, the collisional rate. So there are, let me write now here two consequences that would be important for us. One already you know that the collision, collisional rate, or rate of collisions, rate of collisions, 
which is exactly this inverse one of a tau, yeah, we find out that it is, um, a, let's say, a T0, just to make the formula simple. Yeah, it is one over classical time, which involves cross-section, density, and velocity. But velocity here, we know everything happens on the Fermi surface. So it's Fermi velocity times, so the, uh, the, uh, the collisional time for, um, excite, uh, for the particle with momentum P. And here we have EP over epsilon Fermi squared. There was no derivation, it was just a statement. Yeah? I will, okay. And this is, of course, um, much smaller, yeah, at least for low enough EP closer to the Fermi surface, than EP for P close to PF. <coughs> yeah? This is our excitation energy. This is collision rate that will give you lifetime. And for the excitations which are very close to the Fermi surface, lifetime becomes very large. So this is well-defined excitations. Yeah? So here we have well-defined excitation, but exactly near the Fermi surface, where what we need to describe the low energy physics. But this has another consequence, these things. So we have here, it's well-defined excitations. Well-defined, in other words, mean long living. Yes? No. For P closer to PF, yeah, remember this EP was uh, um, at P squared minus PF squared over 2M modulus. Yeah? When P goes to PF, EP goes to zero. Yeah, we discussed that there are gapless excitations. But the imaginary time, I will present you some formula more precise. Yeah? This one over tau gives you lifetime. Yeah? It behaves like EP squared. So it goes to zero faster than EP. So you have excitations when the P approaches Fermi uh, surface, the real part, which determines all these oscillations, yeah, goes to zero much slower than the imaginary part. That's why they are well-defined. Well-defined excitations, or, oh, oh, oh. okay, excitations. Close to Fermi surface. But the second consequence is that it is in a, a Fermi gas, at least weakly interacting, it's very difficult to reach hydrodynamic regime. So difficult to reach hydrodynamic regime. Because hydrodynamic regime means that you, you need a local equilibrium. Yeah, and that means criteria for hydrodynamic regime is omega tau much less than one. This is hydrodynamic regime. So that means during the period of your oscillation of your, let's say, collective mode or whatever, the particles undergo many collisions such that they establish local equilibrium. Typically, people did numerics, and you need something between two and three, maybe four collisions, to set up a local equilibrium. So, and that's why in a thermodynamic, you're always dealing with density as a position of, uh, as a function of position and time. Local temperature you can introduce as a position of time when you study the heat transfer, or, or, or current J as a function of position and time. This is all local equilibrium position, or even you write the, the distribution of particles where the temperature and momentum, whatever, uh, depend, uh, is, is position dependent. These are local equilibriums, and to, 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 to reach it, you really need, for this type of behavior, you need that the collisions happens on a much smaller time scale than the period of your uh, collective or whatever hydrodynamic uh, behavior. So here, because tau becomes very large, you need either very low frequency 
to work with, or you need somehow increase this coefficient, prefactor. So you have to go to some, what you discussed yesterday, you have to use Feshbach resonance. Well, in, in a given material, this is a given number, but in cold atoms, you have this nope Feshbach resonance, so you can increase the, this, the scattering, scattering length, or so go to even unitary limit, where indeed collisions are very efficient, and even in this case, in principle, you can, I think it was observed experimentally, you can reach the hydrodynamic regime for the, for the, Fermi, for the Fermi gas. But for the weak interaction, this is very hard, and that's why normally you wouldn't have normal sound. Yeah? No thermodynamical sound here. Yeah? But we will see it's exactly what helps and what Landau first noticed that you can have a different type of collective behavior, which is Landau zero sound or collisionless sound. You don't need collisions there. In other words, you completely ignore collisions there. So don't think about kind of local equilibrium, density, et cetera, et cetera. You will see we come, at, at the end of the lecture, we, we come to this, to this point, okay? So uh, these are the two consequences, and we will, uh, they would be important for our purpose. So now let me have this Hamiltonian, and let me do some calculations with that to see uh, what are the effects of this uh, interaction for fermions. Yeah? So let me calculate energy of the ground state is zero up to the first order. With this Hamiltonian. Why first order? Because it's extremely simple. Yeah? You know from perturbation theory, to calculate the corrections to the first order, you need non-perturbed state, and then you just take a metric element of your perturbation, and then you get the answer. So what is our non-perturbed state? This is ground state of two species of fermions. Yeah? Let me put here zero, it's non-perturbed state, which is just a direct product of the two field Fermi sphere for the upper comp up plus component and for the minus component. Yeah? So now I have to take my Hamiltonian, sandwich it between this, yeah, to take the metric sum. Yeah? So of course, uh, um, if I now have this ground state H ground state, yeah, the first part we already know, right? This is the energy of the ideal Fermi gases. So let me write it in a form we know. Yeah, okay. Let me write it in a a bit intermediate form, you will see why I will need it yeah, later on. So you will have sum over P, yeah, and then let me write it explicitly, epsilon P and P plus, plus epsilon P and P minus. Yeah, where N P plus and N P minus are my Fermi Dirac distributions, yeah, which is both of them N P plus equals N P minus, and, and, and this is just step functions P F minus P, and we agree to have the same number of both species such that we don't distinguish, let's say, uh, okay, I can also write here plus minus, but in, at, at this moment it's not that important. Yeah? Okay, so, and, and we know what it is. Yeah? And this is, we know it's, okay, uh, we continue, plus. Now we have an interaction part, G over V, sum over P1, P2, Q, and now we have these, uh, Gs0, and then we have this Ap1 plus Q plus dagger, and then in the end, Np1 plus, uh, and then, uh, let me write only first and the second, at this moment. Huh? So this is what we have to calculate. So here, the answer we know very well. It is N plus 3 over 5 epsilon P plus, epsilon, sorry, Fermi plus, I write it specially plus and minus for the later use. Yeah? Because plus the same expression from the minus component, which is actually exactly the same as this one because the number of particles are the same and masses are the same. Three over five epsilon Fermi minus. And now I have to calculate this term. And here you see I have part of the apparatus that belongs to the minus component and part of the operators that belongs to plus component. Yeah? So this I can put in here because I changed sign minus twice. Yeah? 
So I can put it there. So, so this term is actually uh, separates into a Fermi S, Fermi surface for plus component, where you have to calculate AP1 plus Q dagger plus AP1 plus operator, n times the, the, the similar term for the minus. Fermi surface minus, and then we have AP2 minus Q minus dagger, and then we have AP2 minus and Fermi surface minus. Now, and of course, these averages are only non-zero when Q is zero, no? because otherwise you remove P1, you add P1 plus Q, and it can be the same state only if Q is zero. Yeah? So Q is zero disappears. So sum over Q disappears. So this is non-zero only for Q zero. So therefore, then we have two separate sums, P1 and P2. And then, then Q is zero. This is exactly average is exactly occupation number for P plus and P minus. Yeah? Exactly when Q is zero, we have exactly terms like this with P1 and or P2 plus or minus, but it's averaged of the Fermi C that gives us again this occupation number. So I'll write it like this. I will write it. So here we again behave the same. And here we have plus G over volume. <clears throat> now let me write it like this. Sum over P1 and P1 plus. Sum over P2 and P2 minus. Yeah? But these sums are, are gives just the total number of particles in the plus and in the minus. Yeah? So what I get in the end, I get this part is kinetic energy. And now interaction becomes, in this order is very simple, plus G over volume and plus and minus. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> You can make it, of course, a bit more. Uh, uh, you can take the volume out, yeah, because energy should be extensive quantity, so it should be proportional to the volume. Then here we will have n plus divided by volume. That's our small n plus concentration, three over five epsilon Fermi plus plus n minus three over five epsilon Fermi minus plus then G and plus and minus. Yeah, so very, very simple answer. Huh? First order is very simple. So if I now want to calculate, so let's, let me see what are the effects of the interaction is just added this kind of mean field energy, which for the uniform gas is a constant because n plus equal to n minus. Oh, so it's, they both are constant. Yeah? And in our case, that's just simple. So the only effect of the interaction in the first order, therefore, is just a change of the chemical potential, yeah? Because if I now calculate mu plus, uh, that's especially, like, that's why I carry this plus and minus, huh? Otherwise I have to n, if I etch, if both of them are n, and I increase n by one, that means I add plus n minus. So I have to divide by two, so it's easier like this. So this is um, d e naught over d n plus, yeah. So this we know what to do. Yeah, it was our epsilon Fermi. Remember, we did this calculations for ideal Fermi gas. That was our chemical potential for the ideal Fermi gas at zero temperature. We're working at zero temperature. And here derivatives comes only here. It will disappear, and then we have n minus divided by volume. That's G n minus. Yeah. And the correspondingly, if I calculate the same way mu minus, I will get this 
free particle case plus G and plus. So it's just very simple mean field. Mean field shift, nothing more. You know? So that means that the, let's say for the plus particle, minus particles serves like a constant potential background. Nothing more. So uh, therefore, if I now calculate what's the uh, spectrum of my particles would be to the first order, I would have here simply um, the, the new chemical potential plus P squared minus P Fermi squared over 2M. That would be the only correction that I would have instead of Fermi energy. Yeah, which I just, yeah, okay. I just get this correction, mean field correction. Yeah, this is actually what I write here is nothing but G N minus plus P squared over 2M. Let's just rewrite it. Why I rewrite it? Because as we discussed there, it, so we will interest it in the behavior, what happens with the excitations or particles and holes near the Fermi surface. Uh, so therefore, I just write it in this form that I want to write the formula for P minus PF much smaller than PF. So then my P is close to the Fermi surface. Then, of course, I can expand P minus PF, which is small, and P plus PF, which I will replace by 2 PF. Yeah? So let me write the answer, and then I ask you, should I explain it a bit more? So this is not exact, but... Should I explain more how I get it? Or oh, it's clear? This one. No or yes? Raise the hand who, who doesn't want. OK, you want. OK, good. <laughs> so P squared minus PF squared is P minus PF, P plus PF, and here, in this bracket, you write it as 2PF minus or plus P minus PF. Yeah. And because this is small, you can ignore these things here. It's a second order term. Yeah, because this is small, it's the region where I want to walk in close to the Fermi surface. So therefore, this term is small. And therefore, in this bracket, you can ignore it, keeping only 2PF. And then you divide by 2M, you get PF over M. Okay. So you see the only difference here with the free particles is just the change of the chemical potential. It's not epsilon Fermi anymore, but epsilon Fermi plus GN. Okay. And here is actually for both plus or minus. So now I, write, I, I wrote it because I want to present you now the results, what happens in the second order. So here, it's not that simple anymore. And I need my page yeah, to give you... Ah. Okay, so, no, sorry. Before I go to second order, yeah, I forgot. What I say here, perturbation, yeah, up to first order, let me see what is the parameter that determines for me the validity of my perturbative expansion. Yeah? So, um, let me start. Let me do it maybe here. Expansion parameter. To see, yeah, so this term appears due to our perturbation, and that was our zero order term. So just expansion parameter, we want to have a, a well defined perturbative expansion. We need that this term is much smaller than this one, because otherwise it's not perturbation theory, right? So let's see what happens if I divide. 
the added term with this one, yes, yeah, so I have to compare g n squared, and plus and minus doesn't matter, they're the same in our case, divided by n epsilon Fermi. Yeah, forget about 3 over 5, etc. cetera. So um, uh, one n goes away. So you have these things. So let me now look at it. G, I want to express in terms of my scattering length. Yeah, and if I use my Born approximation, Born approximation I will have 4 pi h bar squared a s divided by m. This is, was my g. Then I have density. And density, remember, that was p Fermi cube divided by 6 pi squared h bar cube. This is my density. And now 2m over p Fermi squared. This is epsilon Fermi inverse. Yeah? So now many things cancels. So, and if I skip some factor of pi, 4, 2, 6, yeah? So f actually 4 over 3 and pi. So you will see what happens here. It comes a dimensionless parameter, AS, P Fermi, divided by H bar. This is what comes out if I neglect all the pi's, falls, etc. A length momentum, we know it's dimension of H bar divided by H bar. This is dimension. And for perturbative expansion, we need this to be much smaller than one. Yeah, and of course this is the case. Yeah, so when AS and PF remind you PF is H bar divided by the average antiparticle separation. Yeah? This parameter is small when the scattering length is much smaller than the average antiparticle separation. So for sure you have either weak interaction or you have a very dilute guess. Yeah? And then it works. So, and then you can indeed do a well-defined perturbative expansion in this parameter. Yeah? And this you can also formulate it uh, now I introduce the standard one. Um, okay. In a Fermi liquid theory, I should call it F. But in normal, okay. So it is this G times the density of states at the Fermi surface. This is standard parameter that appears in all Fermi, yes, Fermi liquid calculations. So now if you calculate it, Exactly. So you get 2 AS P Fermi divided by pi H bar. So this will come all the time. But sometimes I will call it, okay, I will try not to call it different, but in case if I call it lambda, just tell me. Okay, so this is the small parameter that defines the perturbative expansion. And people did quite a lot of calculations so here. Let me give you the results, what they obtain in the second order of the perturbation theory. Now comes the interesting sort of things. There you can do things really analytically to, to a very large extent because you have a small parameter and just the integrals. So what you get is the following. So now if you go to the second order, up to the second order, then you will have, let me put here two, you will get the following thing. Again, we consider this limit, yeah? because you know otherwise uh, it's not guaranteed that they are long-lived. Of course, in a weakly perturbative regime, you still can think about the long-living excitations, but uh, let's consider this P minus P Fermi much less than P Fermi, so close to the Fermi surface, just to have analog of this one. So what you would have here, you would have here mu plus or minus, let me put here two, and, and here, let's, okay. Plus, now comes an interesting story. P Fermi divided by some M star P minus P Fermi. So you get exactly the same form, but with a different mass. And mass here, is um, uh, it's a mass, 
initial one plus, and now we have one, yeah, that what we have in a zero order, in the first order, then comes plus uh, two thought F, yeah, this is F, Uh, 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 sorry, sorry, I, I'm looking at the wrong formula. Sorry. <laughs> uh, not to thought, uh, it's um, 2 over 15. And then we have 7 log 2 minus 1 times F squared. To second order, you see that if the effective mass is different. And it's quite clear, quite clear why. Because in the first order, this interaction as we, as we see here, it's just a mean field shift of the total energy. So if the particle moves on this overall uniform, it, it has, doesn't change. Nothing changes. But in the second order, you have already processes where particles create extra excitations in, let's say, the minus component, and then feel it. So it, it moves there, surrounded by the cloud of excitations. Uh, in a minus component. So it distorts the system and moves together with this distorted cloud, and therefore comes the effective mass, which is heavier than initial mass. So this is effective mass. So it's this mass of this kind of particle plus cloud. Now the chemical potential also get a term. Yeah, so it is... Um, that's what I started to write. So it's epsilon Fermi 1, that was a zero order, plus what we have in the mean field, and this part you can write as two thought, uh, this F. And then you have plus second order part, 11 minus 2 log 2 divided by 15, and now you have F squared. So you see these numbers are log 2, etc. So you have to do some analytics in calculating the integrals. Yeah? So you see you also have a shift in the chemical potential, extra shift. Yeah? But interesting also to see what happens with the distribution of particles. Yeah? So if I now calculate right here NP, whatever, plus or minus, doesn't matter, up to the second order, so this was our result in the zero order in the first order. In the first order, it's just a chemical potential shift, but the Fermi surface remains Fermi surface. So here, what you will get, you will get the following. That will be the answer. You still have discontinuity, but now it's not one, but some, traditionally, it's called Z, big Z. And this big Z is 1 minus 2 log 2 F squared. So it's less than 1. Yeah. And um, uh, who is the theorist in the audience? Uh, do you know Green's functions? Yeah. So it's exactly, it's a, it's a residue in a single particle pole in the green function. Yeah. So it's less than one. But you see, what you have here is actually you get discontinuity. Yeah. It is not smooth. It's really discontinuous. Yeah? So you can calculate what is here, what is there. So people did the, the, the formulas that, yeah. So, but we know that what we are interested in is what happens here. Yeah? Near the Fermi surface. So the idea is, why don't we rescale this part, 1 over z? And it will look like the, because here we don't care what happens. Yeah? The only interest is what happens here. So somehow the naive idea would be, let's just rescale it with 1 over z, and then we have the discontinuity of 1. Yeah? And this is somehow was, I don't know what was the stimulating idea for Landau, for, for thinking about this uh, Fermi liquid, but it's exactly what actually happens in the Fermi liquid yeah? in the end. You have these green functions with Zs, 
you absorb them in some form, and then what is left is just free particles that move, quasi-particles. But, so now, this was a, a, a perturbative expansion, so they are exact. Ah, yeah, one thing I still have to write for you. Um, uh, where it is, where it is, where it is? Where did I have it? Ah, yes, here. Yeah. This is actually the real part. Yeah? In a second order, you get decays. Yeah, that's what we discuss here. An imaginary part of epsilon p plus or minus in the second order is like this. It's minus pi over 4m. Then you have this f squared and you have p minus pf squared, and for some reason, sigma p minus pf, so, so these things you can at the moment ignore. Yeah, just let me put it. Yeah. So you see, you do get imaginary part that corresponds to decay of this plane wave state. Plane wave is not anymore the eigenstate. But decay, of course, is proportional to the f squared, yeah, second order. But it's p minus pf squared. And if you look here, real part is p minus pf. And here we have p minus pf squared. So it's exactly what I wrote there. The imaginary part goes to zero much faster than the real part. That's why if you are close to pf, yeah, your excitations has a long lifetime and are well defined for two reasons, for this one and for this one. Yeah. These things is, of course, very good for the weakly interacting gas when f is small. Yeah, it makes life even better. But in principle, this is not always small. And if you go to unitary case, or you go to liquid helium, for example, 3, where this is something around 2, yeah, if you naively put the numbers. Yeah. Uh, but then this works. This always works. Yeah. This is sometimes, but this always. So that's why it is... Uh, uh, so to say, universal property of the Fermi sphere that the excitations near the Fermi surface has a long lifetime and, and are well defined, and all low energy physics can be formulated in terms of the, these excitations near the Fermi surface. So now we come to the point how we can actually, um, in general, for the normal Fermi system, this we can give the answer for that. If f is of order 1, you cannot give the right number because you have to take all the diagrams. This is an impossible task. You have to go to computer and, and hope it will work, et cetera, et cetera. But in principle, this is generic property. But generically, you cannot calculate that. But what people do then, and what Landau did, he tried to formulate a very general approach to the systems which has these free Fermi uh, gas type of feature, yeah, which has discontinuity, et cetera, fermionic excitations of that type. And uh, uh, then, of course, this approach will involve some parameters, which you cannot calculate, but you can measure them in some experiments. And based on these measurements, you can make other predictions and compare. Does it work or not? This actually can be justified, his, this Fermi liquid theory. Uh, it was purely uh, initially a phenomenological one, uh, as the, in a green function technique. Yeah, it was done later on. And so you can have real meaning what is Z, what is this interaction between quasi particles, etc., in terms of this vortex function for fermions, which you anyway cannot calculate in a strongly interacting case. But you can parameterize them and find experimentally. And that was actually quite successful for helium-3. And I guess for nuclear matter was applied this approach as well to the nuclear matter. So what are the basic ingredients of the Landau-Fermi liquid theory? Uh, the one of the basic, so the most important one, 
is when you study this perturbation theory, right, especially time-dependent perturbation theory, there is this notion adiabatic switching on interaction. Yeah, you start with some state, let's say when you study scattering or interaction with light, at minus infinity there is no interaction, and then it slowly starts. You switch in adiabatically just to avoid these problems with what happens with integrals at plus infinity and minus infinity. Yeah? So here you can think about the same. So you can start with ideal Fermi guess, and then switch in adiabatically the interaction on to its real value. Of course, it's mental exercise. And the question is, what comes out? Yeah? The idea behind the Landau Fermi liquid theory is that there is one-to-one -one correspondence between states in ideal and interacting Fermi gas or Fermi system. So if you start with a ground state, field Fermi surface, in the ideal Fermi gas, you switch on the interaction, it goes to the ground state of the uh, interacting Fermi system. This is kind of looks natural, especially if you have a gap, but here we don't have gaps. Huh? And then, but then you add to the, uh, consider the ideal gas where you have Fermi surface plus a particle, extra or extra hole, huh? And then you switch on adiabatical interaction, then what you get is the state of one, what Landau called quasi-particles or quasi-hole. It's exactly these objects. Yeah? So it's a particle, if you think of this, it's a initial bare particles moved together with the distortion in the many body system that it creates. Yeah? So this, therefore, one particle here extra will go into one quasi-particles, quasi-particle. If you have initial state with two non-interacting, in the non-interacting case, you switch on the interaction, you get to the state with two quasi-particles. And that actually means that there is a very basic assumption here if you think about it. So this kind of, okay, quasi-particles, right? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, of course, we can very easily think in terms of if you put impurity yeah, in a system, then this impurity is some extra things that distort the system around. But here we're talking about the particles of the system, so somehow they have this distortion and at the same time participate in the distortion made by other particles. Yeah, so when, if you think it sounds a bit, but it's many body physics, many body effects, the same, you should ask yourself what's happening in the screening. Yeah, if you have charge system, you have a screening, so that's why, let's say electron system, electric field of the electron, single electron, is screened by other electrons, but at the same time, this electron also participates in screening of the other things. So that's exactly the same. So it's self-organized, many body object. Yeah. But this tells me immediately, if I think a bit more carefully, then I have the consequence, this immediate consequence, number of particles equals to number of quasi-particles. Yeah, and that's exactly what we have here, because remember, Fermi surface, Fermi momentum, is completely determined by the density or the number of particles. And if here, for the interacting case, we have the same discontinuity at the same P-Fermi, that of course leads to the conclusion that if we believe in these quasi-particles, that their number should be the same, because the Fermi momentum is the same. Yeah? This is fine, okay, good. But now if I tell you this is the self-organized object, how would I define the energy? Yeah? How would we define the energy of the quasi-particles? And then, but then it, of course, should be like this. Yeah? So we can define the energy of the quasi-particle, let's say sigma, as the change of the energy of the system if I add one. Yeah? 
So if I would know how my energy depends on the particles number, I can immediately write these things. Yeah, I add the particle and see how the energy change. Yeah. Or I remove the particle with momentum P. So here, I'm going here, I have extra quasi-particles with momentum P, and I have to look how the energy changes. Yeah, and this gives me the energy. Yeah. But when I told you that the quasi-particles are these self-organized objects, this actually, I should, if I consistent, I should introduce the interaction between quasi-particles, but in a very special way. Yeah? So if I add another particles, I, I, I sort of distort my system. Yeah? And this distortion by the particle added changed the self-organization. Yeah? So you would think that in this way, these quasi-particles also slightly change because it's many-body effect. Yeah? So what Landau said is, let me now think that the change of the energy of the quasi-particles by changing the, by adding or removing another quasi-particle is given by the sum of some function f p sigma p prime sigma prime delta n p prime sigma prime. So I add, change the distribution, I add or remove. And because by changing and removing, I rearrange the self-organization, the energy of the quasi-particles changes. So if I combine the two, this is another way of saying that the change of my energy of the system, if I change the quasi-particle distribution, is given by sum over p and sigma, epsilon p sigma delta n p sigma, uh, plus 1 over 2 volume, sum over p prime sigma prime and p sigma, uh, f p sigma p prime sigma prime, delta n p sigma, delta n p prime sigma prime. Of course, there are high order terms, but those are neglected. It's the same statement. These are two equivalent statements. This is phenomenological parameter. I will immediately calculate you now for the ideal for this weakly interacting Fermi gas in the first order. I can also write you down, or you can find in the book, what is F in the second order. Yeah. It actually depends on, because all happens near the Fermi surface, that means the momenta P and P prime lies on the Fermi surface. It's only the matter of angle between them. Yeah. So it's a, actually a function parameterized by the decomposition in ang so it's cosinus of the angle between p and p prime yeah and it's decomposition in this uh, legendre polynomial that give you landau f components but you also have a bit more complicated here you have to introduce with spin it's f and g but let's not make life even more complicated than it is okay so let me now give you an example so how it works So the weakly interacting gas, we can give, I can give you the answer for this F, yeah, and for this epsilon, yeah, but in the, in the interacting system, a strongly interacting system, I cannot calculate, so I have to postulate it. I have to postulate it, this, and actually the, 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 the stronger part of this landau fermi liquid theory, that it can predict all the observable, like effective mass, and some other stuff, susceptibilities, well, effective mass density of states so of specific heat, for example, of the system in terms of this component. So if you measure them one experiment, you should be able to predict the answer for the other experiments. Yeah? So let me now give you an example. So this is exactly, I uh, am yeah, exactly erased this formula. Yeah, okay. So let me quickly, quickly uh, recover what we have here. Yeah? Remember there was the formula that I can remove in this one. Yeah. So what we have here, we have um, uh, sum over P, and then we have uh, this uh, epsilon P N P plus, plus epsilon P N P minus, 
that was our kinetic part, plus, and this was the G over volume, and then sum over P1 uh, and P1 plus, times the sum over P2 and P2 minus. That was the answer for the energy. And now if I just straightforwardly apply this to the first order, we know that there is no distinction actually between particles and quasi-particles. So I give you oversimplified example. But anyway, you can feel it. So if I calculate, for example, quasi-particles energy, yeah, for the plus, yeah, I should take this energy. So it is, it is uh, uh, dE over dN P plus. So how the energy changes if I add or remove one particle. So then I get from here, I will get epsilon P. And from there, only from here, I get G over volume, and the second sum is just n minus. Yeah, so I get exactly this epsilon P plus G n minus. This we already know, yeah, so. Okay, so I can calculate also for the minus, and then I get plus here, and I get plus here. Yeah, so, so far so good. Yeah, but what is F? F. So we see that the, the only F which will be non-zero is P1 plus, let's say, and P2 minus. In the first order, it's only this combination that survives, yeah, because we should have a second derivative of these things or the second derivative of the energy with respect to n delta n's. And the only combination is non-zero when you have one plus and minus. Yeah? That's the only thing. So now if you do things, you get that this is equal actually G. But this is clear, yeah? If you look at this formula, yeah? So if I change the distribution of it minus, I slightly change the mean field energy. And that's exactly what it says, yeah? So now I have, oh, I have enough time. Huh? Good, 40 minutes, okay. So now let me use this. So this looks indeed a bit simple, yeah, because first order, and, and, and the answers are so clear that you say, why do you need it all? But, but if you open the books and, and, and read this, so this is actually applied to more sophisticated uh, systems, and, and there you really, you cannot calculate, but you can parameterize, as I said, yeah, in some components. So let me now use these things to find out, uh, of course, the single particle fermionic excitations, we know that they are practically the same as in the ideal gas, yeah, the only difference is the effective mass. Yeah? But of course, if there is interaction, we should expect, or it's natural to expect that it will have also collective behavior. Yeah? Because interaction can correlate the behavior of particles also. But we don't have the ordinary thermodynamic sounds, yeah? unless we go to very low frequency. What kind of collective behavior we can have here uh, I will now want to, to discuss. So let me now write this one somewhere here, because this we will use. Um, so Landau, okay, so uh, there are actually two ingredients, basic ingredients in the picture. I will stay within the first order results, but in principle, you can do it in a, in a more general form. Just look at the textbooks. Yeah? You have to write a bit more, and uh, yeah. So, but the, the, the principle actually remains exactly the same. So it's just the more formulas, more solid formulas that you will get. So two things. First of all, we have one of a tau goes to zero. Yeah, so this uh, collisional rate is very, very low. Yeah, so it's practically collisionless behavior. And second part is we are interested in the excitations close to the Fermi surface. 
Ja? That means it's a higher energy excitations. Yeah? And high energy excitations are always described by, they're almost classical, they're described by semi-classical things. So now what I want to say, so now suppose I'm using this, looking at the excitations, it will be kind of waves. Yeah, and I assume it's a low wavelength limit, and I assume that the wavelength is much larger than my antiparticle separation. Yeah? And then to describe these things, I can use this local density approximation that we had yesterday in our discussion, yeah, in the, in the literature. Yeah? So the idea is that you describe the behavior of the system as the distribution function of quasi-particles, which is position and time dependent. So you have locally, you put a volume, big volume, which is much larger than the antiparticle separation, but on the other hand, much smaller than the wavelength for the sound we are going to study. And there you have almost everything local, and there we have a local Fermi sphere. Yeah? That was used in this trapped Fermi gas. Yeah, so it's a, a local momentum distribution. Of course, at equilibrium, the um, n p sigma uh, t zero is just step function, yeah, p Fermi minus p. Yeah. <coughs> so, but saying that, yeah, I can write for these things standard kinetic equation. Yeah. So, semi-classical kinetic equation. And all kinetic equations are, are built, at least in a semi-classical way, on the same principle. You take a total derivative, time derivative, of your distribution function. That means partial derivative, yeah? plus, so this tells you how particle escape from this particular phase space. Yeah? Well, it can directly depends on time, this is a partial derivative, but then the particle can escape simply because they have velocity or, so, so the next step would be just take a gradient spatial gradient of this distribution function and times the velocity, r dot. No? This is dr dt. In my case, in our case, that we can write it p over m, yeah, just to come back to this momentum. No? And next, the same, the p can also change with time, right? Not only r can change of the particle with time, but also p. So what you get here, gradient with respect to p of this n p sigma r t, but now we need a force. Yeah? So here that acts on a particle, yeah, and that's according to the second law, p dot is f. Yeah? So this is simply p dot, yeah, which is f, and here we have r dot. Now this is r dot. But then, on the right-hand side, this is sort of kinematic motion yeah, of a single particle. But now comes, so here comes the collisions. Yeah, so here you have just motion, maybe uh, the, the field, the, the force that changes the P and drives the particle from this phase space. But now there is a collision here, which tells you the loss because the particle with quasi-particle momentum collide and the quasi-momentum changes, so it's a loss. But on the other hand, there could be some other particles, quasi-particles collide, and one of them come to the momentum P. This is gain. But these things, proportional to collisional rate, and this is very small, so we just set it to zero. No collision, collisionless regime. No? 
because collision rate is very small. In the hydrodynamic, it's opposite. And for those who study this Chapman and Skok method of deriving hydrodynamic equation, they start from here. This is the most important part. And all this gives you this, the rest. But this is zero. In our case, it's zero. So now let's closely look what we have here. The first of course question, how can I define the F? What's the force? Yeah. But we know what we will look at. We will look at a small deviation, of course, because we want sort of linear form from equilibrium. Yeah. Which is actually a step function plus this delta n pr rt. But if this thing, so this is constant, no? so it's, if, but this, if this thing depends on position, then the quasi particles energy changes and becomes dependent on position. And this change of the quasi-particle energy of position, it's like moving in a position-dependent potential. So therefore, that immediately generate these things, because it's position-dependent, generate position-dependent change of quasi-particles. It's like external position-dependent external potential field. So the force is therefore minus gradient of these delta epsilon p sigma. And if I now use uh, this form, yeah, so I immediately write down that this is minus gradient with respect to r, because we have also gradient with respect to p. And then I have here one of the volume of sum over p prime sigma prime, delta n p prime sigma prime. And uh, in this case, we also have G. Yeah? This is our G, is our F function, and this is G. Yeah? So this is my force. Yeah? So now I can look at this equation, uh, insert there this decomposition, and see what I will get. Uh, and this sigma is, should be opposite yeah, to, to sigma prime. Yeah? So, yeah, because it's only plus minus. So what happens here? So here, uh, time derivative. And this thing is time independent. So it's only second term. So let me write it for the plus component. D over dt, delta n p plus. And let me skip for a moment rt. Yeah? So here, gradient over space, this is again invariant. Yeah? So I have to look here yeah, to, to these things. And uh, so this gives me plus P over M in a general form for beyond the first order would be, of course, M star, effective mass. But in our case, this is, and then I have gradient over R, delta N P plus. Yeah. And now comes the fourth term, yeah, where I have minus G over V, um, sum over P prime, delta N P minus, P prime minus. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and the gradient, of course, comes inside. So let me write it here. And these things, that was my force. And now I have to multiply with the gradient with respect to momentum that acts on my equilibrium distribution plus delta n p plus. And it's all zero. Yes, so I just simplify. But now, of course, I'm in the first order. To first order, you see you have here delta n. So therefore, this delta n I can ignore. Yeah. Uh, 
But now I have to calculate these things. The question? Uh, because I have here delta n, and delta n is small, and this gives me order delta n squared. Yeah? So that's why I'm in the first order in delta n. Yeah? So this term I just ignore. But I have to calculate these things, but these things are very easy to calculate. Yeah? If you remember the formula from this vector analysis, if you calculate the gradient of the function that depends on r, which you probably did a lot in electrodynamics, yeah? So what you have to do, you have to differentiate this function with respect to modulus and multiply with the unit vector. Yeah? So here it's exactly the same. So if I now calculate this delta p of this step function pf minus p, uh, I will get the unit vector p over p yeah, times the derivative with respect to p or the step function. And the step functions look like this. So it's minus delta function. Yeah? And let me call this p over p is just ep. Yeah? Unit vector in the direction of p. So finally what I get <coughs> looks like this. And now I can do exactly the same for the minus component, right? So then I get here minus, I get here minus, but here I get plus. That's the only difference. Yeah? So finally, equation that I have to solve look like this. d over dt plus p over m gradient r acting on delta m p plus, let's say, let me put now RT. Now it becomes a bit shorter, so I can put everything there. And now I have plus, and now I have G over volume, because minus and minus from the these, from here, yeah, minus uh, G over V, and I have delta function, because delta function doesn't matter. P minus PF or PS minus P doesn't matter. P minus PF. Yeah, and then I will have EP, and then I have here uh, sum over P prime, gradient of acting on R on delta N P prime minus is zero. And for the minus, I will get X like this. Yeah. So that's the equation I have to solve. Now it becomes simpler and simpler and simpler. Yeah. <clears throat> so now to solve this equation, you see there is here delta function. I will use the ansatz. Let me guess how the solutions look like. Huh? Clear. I am interested in delta n very close to the Fermi surface, and here I have these things. Yeah, so I would use the following thing: delta n p plus or minus on R t would be some function kappa that depends only on the direction of p, for the reason because I put modulus of p being on a Fermi surface. Yeah, I can write here, of course, P, but with this delta function, it's only direction of P because modulus is fixed. Yeah? And then I write, I want waves, I want sound, I promise you, zero sound. Yeah? Doesn't matter if it's zero, it doesn't matter if it's Landau, but it is sound. So I write it like this, I, K, R, minus omega T. I'm looking for solutions in this form. So this is my plane wave propagating in the direction k with the frequency omega. Yeah? And this is how it depends yeah? in, in here. And maybe here I should write plus or minus. Yeah? So now let me plug it in and see what happens. These things, t and r, act only on here. Yeah, because these things position and time independent. Yeah? 
And we know how this works on the, on the exponent. Yeah? So what we get here would be the following from this term. I will get, let me take minus out, because the time derivative gives me minus i omega. Let me take minus out, minus i out. Then I'll have omega minus um, these things. Um, uh, the, the gradient gives me i k. i is there minus s. I just put here. Uh, okay, let me write it like this. Uh, p over m e p. Yeah, that was my p. p times e p is my p. And then I will have k. Yeah, that comes from my exponent. And all this x on chi plus minus e p. And here I still have, have a delta function and exponent. This is this term. Now the second part plus g over v, delta function I have here. Now I have, so here, Gradient with respect to R, it's again acts only on here, yeah, and gives me IK. So I will have here I K times EP. Yeah. This is sum over P prime, so exponent I can take out. And what is left yeah, is sum over P prime of my chi p prime minus or plus, yeah, because the component here is opposite, times the delta function, p prime minus pf. And it's all zero. That's what I have. That's the equation. No? Of course, now I safely can, can cancel Exponent, yeah, plane wave. I can also cancel p delta function with the only option that I have when I cancel, I have to write here pf. Yeah. Uh, so finally, and, and then uh, let me, this, I know that pf over m is just Fermi velocity. Yeah. So then it would be even nicer. So finally what I get, let me take this term to the right and I cancel E here, I here, and I here. So, and what finally what I get would be like this omega minus uh, V Fermi EPK acting on my chi uh, plus or minus on EP equals. Uh, G times E P times K. Yeah, this is scalar product here. And then one of the volume, sum over P prime, and chi minus or plus P prime delta P prime minus P F. That's what it is. Yeah. So uh, let me now uh, uh, calculate these things. Yeah, because I have here delta function, so actually what I have here is epsilon p prime, yeah, because the modulus p prime is p fermi. I should probably write it. Okay, here. Okay. I uh, yeah, just am a bit, a bit inconsistent with my notations, right? Because here I have plus minus. Yes, uh, and here for some strange reason, I write it so minus plus e p prime. Yeah, because anyway. Yeah. So let me now look carefully at this integral. Yeah. Let me let me calculate g times one of the volumes, sum over p prime, and then I have minus or plus e p prime, delta p prime minus p f, and of course I can calculate integral over modulus, but I cannot calculate integral over angle. Yeah because these things depends on angle. So what you get, sum over p prime I replace with the integral, 
as before volume disappears, I will have G, and I will have integral over dP prime 2 pi h bar cube. And then I will have this chi minus or plus E P prime, and then delta function, P prime minus PF. So now what you have here, let me do it like this. Um, it is G, and then let me write it 4 pi, and then I have 2 pi h bar cube, and then this is, I will have P Fermi squared, yeah, because that was P prime squared DP prime, and P prime is PF. I took it out, and then I have here D omega uh, E prime, E, sorry, P prime, divided by 4 pi. This is this 4 pi. No? And then chi minus or plus E P prime. This integral I cannot perform because chi is an unknown function. Yeah? But I keep it like this. So now if I look carefully what stays here, yeah, for this coefficient. Yeah? So what I get, it would be, uh, let me this write it like this. G, then I have 4 pi, 2 pi h bar cube, and then I, I do it like this. Pf and times mpf, and then pf over m. Yeah? I like it like this. Divided, multiply. This gives me the Fermi velocity. And this gives me the density of state. You can just look. This is the density of state at the Fermi surface. Yeah? So what I get here, I will get G times density of states at the Fermi surface times the Fermi velocity. And this is, remember, this is our big F. So I will have big F times the Fermi velocity. So finally, we are almost there. Equation that you have to solve now becomes extremely simple. And of course, you can have several modes, but let me consider the simplest case where chi plus equals chi minus and equals chi. This is in phase mode. Yeah, when the two components oscillate in phase, yeah, you could have anti phase, that there would be some kind of spin also involved, but let me consider this one. Yeah, so therefore I, I reduce everything to the single equation. Now let me just to save my time and remove it. Yeah, for this case. So how would you solve this equation? Ideas. This equation, this type of equation appears all the time. All the time. How would you solve it? There is a very simple trick to solve such sort of equations. Yeah, you see here I have the integral of my chi. Yeah? So the idea is isolate chi on the left hand side and integrate. Yeah? So if I write now divide by these things, so I will get that chi EP is F times V Fermi K EP divided by omega minus V Fermi K E P, oh, let me skip this, should be consistent, times this integral. Yeah, so now if I integrate over direction of E P over four pi, yeah, I will get the same integral, so of course I have to integrate this one, on the right-hand side, 
I will have to integrate this one, but this is a number. So it is the same number as I would get here. And I cancel. Yeah. Assuming that this is non-zero, because otherwise it makes no sense. Yeah. So you just integrate d omega p over 4 pi, both sides. The integral cancels, because it doesn't matter how we call it, p prime, p, or p double prime, or q, whatever. Yeah? And this cancels, so equation that you get in the end is 1 equals f integral d omega p over 4 pi v fermi k e p divided by omega minus v fermi k e p. Yeah, and so the only thing that you have to worry about, yeah, you introduce the polar, oh, sorry, spherical angles, polar and azimuthal angles in the, direct, in the world, uh, space of P along the K. Yeah? So then you get 1 over 2 because integral around these directions, 2 pi will disappear. Let me write it. 2 pi over 4 pi. And now integral D on cosinus theta yeah, that's, and now you will have V Fermi K cosinus theta divided by omega minus V Fermi K cosinus theta. Yeah, cosinus theta is a new variable. You can perform the integral. Yeah, but you see already, so here, I, I, it's, it's a simple integral, but I guess, oh, I still have, no, but probably I will spend some time on something else. Yeah, it's a simple integral. Yeah, I'll give you simply the answer. But you see, if you have omega, if you write omega as uh, S V Fermi K, yeah? see? So now instead of omega as a function of K, I'm looking for S as a function of what is left is just interaction, right? F, because K, K will disappear. So equation that would be 1 over F or maybe 2 over f, yeah, because this is half, equals, and if I call this z, I will have uh, integral dz minus 1 to 1, and I will have z, and here I will have s minus z. And this integral you can calculate, and the answer is, and the answer is, Yes, so it is, oh, okay. Let me, let me uh, extract it from this. So it is S log S plus one S minus one uh, minus two. Yeah, so that's the answer. So you see, whether this equation has solution or not, let's just analyze. In a perturbative regime, f is very small. So this is very large number. Yeah? So in principle, you cannot solve this analytically. No? But in a limit when f is small, you can give an approximate solution. Because this is very large. How you can get large number here? When s approaches 1, that's the only option. Yeah? Because we want to have s somehow positive. right? So S approaches one, then we have logarithm, big number, and then we can balance large number on the left and the large number on the right. Yeah? So I give you immediately the approximate solution. It is one plus two e to the minus two over F. So that's the answer. It's approximate solution for F much smaller than one. Yeah, this approximate solution. Important point that, that it is larger than one. And why it is important, it makes this mode uh, long-lived, non-decaying. Why is this? Remember this picture. Remember, because zero sound, this is called Landau zero sound. It's 
distortion, this deformation of the Fermi surface that propagate in space and time in a, on a very specific form of deformation. Yeah, this is exactly how it is. It's more deformed in the direction of propagation rather than, so it's very asymmetric distortion. You can have a look how it depends on the direction. Yeah? Important, so here was this V Fermi. Yeah? It is larger than one, so that means this is here. This is S times K. So it's, it lies in here, so this is S. Yeah. Probably I should put here. K, so right, K. That means this branch is outside this continuum. If it would be inside, there would be definitely a strong coupling between this mode and this mode, and the, this, uh, this zero sound will decay very fast. Zero sound, if you wish, is a collective coherent motion of particle hole excitations, which it pushed away from this continuum of particle hole, single particle hole excitation. This is single particle hole excitation continuum, and this is collective mode, which is coherent, yeah, because it's deformation of the Fermi surface. It's particles or holes, depending whether it's delta n is positive or negative, and this is pushed outside of this continuum that makes it long living. Yeah? So that's why it is well defined. This is important for uh, well, that its excitation is well defined and don't decay very fast. Yeah? So now, uh, so you see the velocity, uh, sorry, I should write here Fermi velocity, yeah? because it's, it's in here. So this is this velocity of the zero sound, yeah, which is larger than V Fermi, but exponentially small larger for the weak interaction. Yeah? So now I, I show you that it's definitely not the thermodynamical sound. Yeah? Because if you would think, sometimes there is some exercise in statistical mechanics, what's the sound velocity for the ideal Fermi gas? Yeah? There is no sound behavior, just a single particle that moves. But it's just to force you calculate this quantity. Uh, it's just, there is no physics in this exercise. It's just mathematics. Is just to calculate this quantity, you know that the sound, thermodynamical sound, that's why we operate with the pressure and, and density, it is this a, a pressure over mass density. So that means mass, it's one over m dp dn. Yeah? Pressure means, yeah. this is thermodynamical sound. And if you perform these calculations, you are tired, and I'm tired. <laughs> but you can perform it, clearly, because we know that P is 2 over 5 N times epsilon Fermi. So in total, you have here N, the here, this is N to the power 2 thought. Remember, P Fermi is a density to the power 1 thought. So therefore, epsilon Fermi, which is P Fermi squared, is density to the power 2 thought. So in total, you have uh, uh, here, you have total power of n, 5 over 3. Yeah, so it scales, this can scales like n, 5 over 3. And if you perform the derivative, you get 1 over m, and here you get 2 over 3 times 5, so it's 2 thought, and then epsilon Fermi. 1n goes away, and what is left is these things. And if I put it here, I will get 1 thought p Fermi, over m squared, it is v Fermi squared over 3. And if you would have thermodynamical sound, its velocity should be v Fermi divided by square root of 3. That would be our thermodynamical sound for the ideal Fermi gas if it would exist. Yeah? And clearly the different, it's interesting for the superfluid gas, Fermi gas, when you have BCS pairing, that would be the sound of the this Bagalyov of Anderson Goldstone mode. So, but for the normal Fermi guess, it is like this. Yeah. Uh, probably you guess that I consider the case that G is positive. Repulsive Fermi guess. Somehow I stated it, but never, never write it explicitly. Yeah. So that's what we have. So if I now compare, 
ideal Fermi gas with interacting repulsive Fermi gas. So this is the last things that I want to say today, because next week we will consider attractive Fermi gas and a BCS pair. So this is ideal, and this is repulsive. So first of all, if I look at the distribution, particles at t equals zero, that's a step function. In this case, it is discontinuous, but it, it's not the step function. And this is discontinuity. It's less than one. That's a distribution function. If I look, so this is the distribution. The second, if I look at the excitations close to the Fermi surface, so here excitations, I will have EP is PF divided by M modulus P minus PF. And here I will have EP equals PF divided by M star P minus PF. So single particle excitations look exactly the same as in the ideal gas, but with a different mass. Yeah? Collective mode, no. Here we have Landau zero sound. Very specific mode. And finally, for example, if you ask me, I told you this is a trademark of the Fermi surface, specific heat yeah, at low temperature, linear dependence of specific heat. Yeah? Let me, let me com comment on this. For specific heat is pi squared over three, if I remember correctly, density of state times the temperature. Yeah? So if I calculate here specific heat, of course, you have thermally excite all the branches that you have, yes? And all the branches here are single particle excitations, yeah, which are now quasi-particle, and in this case, collective mode. So there would be two contributions, from single particle fermionic excitations and from collective mode. Uh, but this one, it's like phonon in metals or whatever. It's a linear dependence of spectrum. And if you remember this course, yeah, it's a T to the cube. Collective excitation and small temperatures contribute like third power of temperature. So what you would have, CV would be pi squared over three density of state with a star times temperature plus contribution of the collective mode, so zero sound, but at small temperature, this is negligible. And this new Fermi star is effective mass M star P Fermi divided by two pi H bar cube. Oh no, in this case, of course, we have two components, so I have to multiply with a factor of two. Yeah. So, but you see, this linear behavior is, is, is there, yeah? That's why it makes no sense to look at the ideal Fermi gas, because as I said, from the point of view of single particle fermionic excitations, interacting gas, repulsive gas, and ideal gas behave in a very similar way. I think I should stop now. Next week, we go to BCS pair. Yeah, so we see how even very weak attractive interaction changes life of the fermionic system. Okay, thank you for your attention, and sorry for a bit being over time. <laughs> yes. What's the typical meaning for F small? Sorry, sorry? What's the typical meaning of small F? We can see the, uh, remember, it's exactly our perturbative expansion, weak interaction. Yeah. F, my, remember F? was G, our interaction strength, times the density of states. F small means you have either very low density or you have a very small interaction strength. Yeah? So typically you are in a gas. 
it's very good for the these atomic gases. In 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 liquid, in helium three, this is of order two. It's not small. F is small. You can calculate. As a theorist, F is not small. You have to ask your mathematical physicists or computer people who know codes, who can write the programs to come. More? Can you say again why you don't take, uh, you don't care about Yes, because if t, if t goes to zero, yeah, if t is very small, clearly this t cube is much, much smaller than, than t. Because of cube, it's only because of cube, because of, of of a low temperature, low temperature, low temperature specific heat remains proportional to T, with a very small corrections of order T cube that comes from a zero sum. Even though the parameter is too high. No, 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 no. It's it's a, it's parameter. This F is actually small. One of the F. So you see, this is very small number. So it's practically Fermi velocity that you have here. But it's sound, anyway, sound. Whatever you have sound, this is like this. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. I guess if you have a trap, you should think in terms of local density of states. Or lo local density approximation, which which you introduce, and then of course, it's a finite system. You you cannot talk about the waves. Yeah, you have a discrete spectrum, and you have to calculate simple equations. becomes much more unpleasant yeah, to calculate. But the idea remains the same. Any other questions? Okay, I think for those who wants to ask questions, the private. You've you can ask, but the rest, please go for lunch. Just remove this. Yeah.